Welcome History 141 students, John Fia here for the virtual office hours. This is your weekly update on lectures and all things U.S. Survey to 1865. Our trusted producer, Megan Piet, is here with us as usual. By the way, if you haven't watched all of episode 17, go to the end and you'll see uh, uh, Megan in her Napoleon uh, costume for Halloween. Um, I think I even put that on the blog, too, if some of you who follow The Way of Improvement leads home. Uh, but today, we're coming up on an exam. Uh, so I want to do one more office hour just to cover uh, the last two lectures in class where we've been talking about Jeffersonian America. Uh, and one of the things, uh, or several things, that I want you to think about uh, as we think about our man here, Thomas Jefferson, I'm, I'm going to be playing around with these Pez dispensers a little bit today. Um, remember, Jefferson really sees his election in 1800 as a, almost a second revolution, the revolution of 1800. Uh, he disagrees uh, with many of the policies of the Federalist presidents, and go back and look at my Federalist One versus Federalist Two uh, bonus track that we did last week to, 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 to make sure you know what I'm talking about when I refer to these Federalists. But here they are, Washington and John Adams. We don't have Alexander Hamilton because he wasn't a president, and Pez doesn't make a, a Alexander Hamilton um, dispenser. Although if anyone out there finds an Alexander Hamilton uh, dispenser, or any other founders for that matter, send them along and we'll add them to the group. But obviously Jefferson does not like the way in which the 1790s went, uh, and he is, really sees his presidency as a sort of new birth of liberty, right? The Enlightenment, liberty moving forward, you know, going against the tyranny of the Federalists, right? The George, George uh, III, it's not George III this time, it's George Washington and the Whiskey Rebellion and their vision for America. Of course, Jefferson's vision, much more agrarian much more spreading out via land, much more concerned about the common farmer. So he's elected in 1800, and we spent some time talking about his administration. We talked about his first term uh, in which the Louisiana Territory, Louisiana Purchase, is really the pinnacle uh, of that first term. Uh, when you think about the Louisiana Territory, don't just think about it as a huge land mass, right? That's certainly the basic stuff that you need to know. But think about the meaning of that. Think about the political meaning of it, right? Jefferson is, wants to spread the country westward. Uh, he wants to uh, establish, uh, in many ways, uh, places in the west where more and more common people are going to go and get access to land. Land equals independence. Land equals the American dream. Uh, so it's, the purchase of Louisiana fits very well into his political vision uh, for the country. And, of course, the Federalists don't like this at all because they're worried that, well, what are you going to do, right? You're gonna, Jefferson's going to establish all these new states out in Louisiana. They're going to be, uh, you know, they're not going to like the Federalists in these new states, and we're going to basically, you know, disappear from the face of the political landscape. And, of course, that's pretty much what happens. Uh, so the Federalists are very much aware that this is, this is in the works. Um, also realize the constitutional debates over, uh, over the Louisiana Purchase, and I think I made a quick comment in class, that here in these very early years, and in some ways it's not much like we have it today, uh, people use the Constitution, interpret the Constitution either loosely or strictly uh, to basically get what they want out of the Constitution, and uh, Jefferson clearly is doing this when he, when he takes a very loose interpretation of the uh, of the Constitution, uh, saying I, the Constitution doesn't forbid me from buying this territory as a president, so I can do it. So you have the Louisiana Territory. You talked a little bit about Lewis and Clark, uh, some of the things associated with their mission, uh, a mission for both scientific exploration and the declaration of political power or sovereignty. Uh, one is fairly successful, the scientific, the political uh, uh, announcement to these Indian tribes that America now owns this land. Uh, that one doesn't go go as well as Jefferson would like, uh, but go back and look at you know some of the things we said about that expedition. We talked a little bit about Sacagawea uh, and and the way she's been portrayed in American culture. Um, the second term for Jefferson not so good. Uh, foreign policy problems. Uh, he finds himself again in a situation in which the Europe is not respecting uh, the uh, neutral rights 
of uh, the Americans. Uh, Britain especially is impressing American ships. And I think to Jefferson's credit, and again we can debate this, uh, but I don't want you to perceive Jefferson to sort of be a wimp on this. Uh, I, I tend to see him more as trying to come up with a peaceful solution to stop the impressment of ships so the United States doesn't have to go to war. Unfortunately, the result is the Embargo Act of 1807, which becomes another disaster for the United States and especially hurts the common people and the common farmers who tend to vote for Jefferson. So understand why the Embargo Act fails. Understand Jeffer this is Jefferson's major attempt to, uh, to um, deal with these uh, problems of impressment uh, in the seas and especially in and around the Caribbean and the West Indies. So by the time Jefferson leaves office, remember what I said, he doesn't even list the presidency as one of his major accomplishments on his tombstone. Uh, he says, I wrote the Declaration of Independence, I founded the University of Virginia, I wrote the Virginia Statute of, Liber of Religious Liberty, but he never quite saw his, his presidency as one of his great achie greatest achievements, I should say, in life. So, Jefferson's successor, uh, where is he here? James Madison, uh, he comes on the scene in 18, uh, 1808. He has 1809. He has to uh, basically deal with all of the problems that Jefferson left him, and really now has to deal with this, you know, this kind of perfect storm leading to war. One, you have these young congressmen, Calhoun, Webster, Clay, the War Hawks, who are saying, "Enough of this. We need to assert ourselves. We need to go to war with Britain until they stop uh, impressing our ships." And, and until they start respecting our neutral rights. You have the Tecumseh and the Prophet incident out on the frontier uh, where there's rumors that Tecumseh is actually working for the British. And then you have, of course, the third, the impressment of British ships. This storm, this threefold, uh, sto these three storms sort of coming together leads the United States into war. And after the exam, or actually on, on Friday, uh, we'll talk a little bit more. This week, we'll actually talk a little bit more about the consequences and the implications of the War of 1812 and how that shapes what's going what's gonna to happen in the future. So um, hopefully, you'll do well in the exam. You can go, go look at your notes about the office hours and so forth. Uh, you know, prepare well. And... Um, if you, I always say this, if you um, don't believe in luck, I, I should say good luck, and if you don't believe in luck, may God providentially give you the grade you deserve uh, on this exam, and I will see you on Monday.